Good evening, everybody. Did you enjoy your food? Yeah. Um, it's good at the Hayes, isn't it? You just sort everything out for you. Lovely people. Um, good eggs, did you say? I didn't have any eggs, but no. Um, two, two things before we get cracking with this evening. Um, if you want to sign up for the, um, the workshops tomorrow, please, if you could do... Most of you did it tonight, then we'd be able to know which room to put you in. So if one of them's, like mine and Claire's, is exceptionally popular, um, <laughs> then, uh, <laughs> then we'll put it in this room. Um, so it just helps us. The other two rooms are a bit... Uh, just as an example, yeah, just off the top of my head. Um, do keep um, having a look at uh, what Hannah's producing for us. There's some incredible things on there already. And um, oh, the other thing was, if anyone fancies um, a cheeky 5K tomorrow morning, oh. I'm always looking for a running. <laughs> I'm always looking for a running friend at these things. So, seven o'clock. You want to come? 5K. No, not money. Um, that wasn't even that funny, was it? <laughs> you tried your hardest, though. Um, it's a lovely run round the reservoir, so if anyone wants to come, let me know later. Uh, no, no. Okay. <laughs> Do I need to pray to get us all to be serious now? Um, tonight, tonight we want to do um, three three things. Um, I just want to. I'm going to talk for a, a short time. And then uh, Ben Woodfield's going to come and join me, and um, we'll do a duet for a while. <laughs> and um, and then we're going to we're going to have a little bit of um, quiet and prayer, and it's just going to kind of lead into a time of where we're just making a bit of space, really. For so Sam's going to come. Um, big thanks to Th Sam for doing the music for us. Um, <laughs> Sam uh, has been working in the Groves Estate in Chester for the last eight years and just become the vicar of St. Barnabas in Hattersley, Hattersley being a theme uh, recently. So if you want to join his team, go and have a chat with him. <laughs> um, and he's, Sam's just going to lead us in a, in a few songs of worship and we're going to have time to reflect and pray and just... Um, if, if people would like to receive prayer and stuff, we're going to make that little bit of space uh, after the, the talking. Um, and then after that, they'll be from about nine-ish. They'll light the fire pits, which are over just across the grass. Um, obviously, marshmallows will be available and, um, and the bar will be open. So do kind of use that time to have some fun and uh, chat to each other. Um, I want to just reflect a little bit on a couple of decades of planting and kind of pioneering in one estate in Salford, which is called Languithy. And I want to bring out a few thoughts around the themes of weakness and vulnerability, and then some stuff about provision and perseverance. Um, how, do we, how do we live well when we do these things? How do we be sustainable? So some of what I want to talk about comes from my own experience of not always doing that well and kind of correcting that and getting, it, getting better at it. And also just working with people over the last six years, especially in, through my theological college work, um, with loads of people all over the country who are pioneering and planting into these kind of areas. And I said earlier, I do lots of kind of one-to-one -one chats, especially here. I feel like I live here because I work for two theological colleges and they both have their residentials here. So I'm literally going home tomorrow lunchtime and coming back here on Friday morning. <laughs> um, and I, but I do lots of one-to-ones with different pioneers and planters and the conversations often go in a similar way. Um, I'll say, how's it going? And they'll tell me, they'll take about 20 minutes to tell me loads of stories about what they've been up to, because they always tend to be cracking storytellers. And, uh, and so I'll listen to their stories and I'll feel inspired by them. Um, and, and then 
and they'll tell me, and then I'll say, how are you getting on? And, they'll, and then they'll tell me about the kind of missional challenges they're facing, you know, leading a team, making disciples, reaching new people. And then I'll say again, and how are you? And, and then they might tell me another story <laughs> so that they don't have to answer. But if they're feeling brave, they'll often say something like, and this happens so often to me, uh, they'll say something like, it's actually really tough, to be honest with you. And I've thought about quitting quite a lot. And I feel really lonely. And I feel like no one gets me in what I'm doing. And to be honest, I think if one more big bad thing happens, I'm going to just jack it in. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I kind of smile in a comforting and reassuring way, not like mocking them. Um, <laughs> And I think back on my own life, and I think of probably about three occasions in the last 24 years when I've kind of hit that wall and made my secret exit plans. And, or I think about most Sunday nights when I have an adrenaline crash and feel like I'm rubbish at this stuff and why am I doing it. And um, I th reflecting over 24 years of ministry in one place, planting a church... Uh, but well, we were firstly we, were, we joined with the Eden Network to plant one of the first Eden projects. The second one, uh, which was in Salford, and then five years later, in 2004, we started Lang with the Community Church, um, and all of that stuff. Reflecting back, I think it's possible to really thrive in this kind of ministry. I think I've been to loads of like urban. Um, forum things over the years and sometimes they're really depressing <laughs> um, sometimes it's like each speaker gets up and tells you how their uh, estate is worse than <laughs> yours <laughs> you know we're in the top this you know, everyone knows their like church urban fund <laughs> statistics <laughs> and uh, <laughs> it's like the opposite of going to one of these um, church growth conferences where people say my church grew from 10 to a million, you know, in three weeks. And, <laughs> but but we, in, we say, well, my church has got the highest rates of this or that. And, and everyone's like, wow, you're amazing. <laughs> and um, <laughs> we kind of compete. And, and sometimes people feed that as well. Like they'll go, oh, what a, what a sacrifice you've made. You know, what, what amazing people you are that you would give yourself to this place and to, to such a difficult thing. But I think probably all of you in this room would agree, this is a privilege, what we get to do. It's an absolute privilege to follow Jesus in that way. It's an honor to join in with what God is doing. So much joy to be found. There's so much hope and beauty. But I think the key for me is how we learn to live in a place of weakness and fragility. How do we learn to to live in that place and to thrive in that place rather than struggling and always wanting to get out of it. Um, my, my prayer, especially in the early years of doing church in Languedy, was um, I wanted to be strong and I wanted consistency and I wanted growth. And I was like, you know, and I think sometimes we get hampered by that, that kind of healthy things grow mentality. You hear it at these conferences and you're like, yeah, but also really unhealthy things grow um, and destroy your body. And um, actually, really healthy things sometimes don't grow as well, depending on where they're planted or what stage they're at in their life cycle. And so we need to get away from that myth of healthy things always grow. Um, growth is dependent on context. It's dependent on calling. It's dependent on what season you're in. Um, it's not a sign of success or divine favor. For me, success is about faithful obedience to Jesus. Nothing more and nothing left. Who said preach then? Nice one. I like you. <laughs> um, I so, so often I prayed the prayer in the early years. God, if you would only give me this number of extra people in my church or team, if you could only give me this much money per month, if we could grow big enough, so that I don't have to think about where the next bit of money is going to come from, where 
the next support for this thing that you've called us to do is going to come from? Where my flipping energy is going to come from? Um, why do I have to come back to you every day? You know, <laughs> can't it last for, <laughs> for a year or two? And come into the Bible for that, that verse in 1 Corinthians 1, 27 has meant loads to us over the years. God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. And there's something that you learn when God calls us to this stuff is that God's really strong in our weakness. And the solution to our weakness is not for us to get stronger, bigger, more financially stable, more consistent, but to, to, to increase our view and our trust in the strength of God and the faithfulness of God. Um, in 2 Corinthians, Paul says, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I'll boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. How many times do we see the power of God in our weakness? We've seen that so many times over two and a half decades that when we're at our weakest point, we see the most power that uh, come um, through the things that we do. We see the miracles. That's when the miracles happen. Um, if I think about the my kind of best stories that I could impress you all with, they'll always come at the time of our weakness, our greatest weakness, when we thought it could be all over, when we thought that we couldn't go on. And that's when God does stuff. And that's why Paul says, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses in insults, hardships, persecutions, difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. And I think for us as a church, what we've been discovering about weakness and fragility is that we can live well in that place. We can find joy. We do find joy and laughter. And there's so much laughter that we, we've... You know, I remember the, a year, four years ago, it's one of the toughest years that we've had in all the t couple of decades there was so much laughter in that year as well. There was so much joy as we faced those issues, as we pressed into God, that he just gave us that thing that Claire said, the joy of our, the Lord is our strength. We've known that time and time again. Um, and there was a story that some of you might have heard me tell, but um, there was a lady in our community early on who... Um, decided that she wanted to enter Languither in the Britain in Bloom competition. And um, at the time, it, that was hilarious because um, when we first moved in in 1999, which is a great year because I got married and United won the treble, uh, <laughs> <laughs> praise the Lord, <laughs> whatever. And, um, <laughs> and um, we, 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 moved, <laughs> we moved in then and... Um, Oh, I forgot what I was saying now. Uh, and, <laughs> wherever, <laughs> I was just thinking about that Solskjaer goal. And, <laughs> whenever, um, wherever you looked, there was probably, I think, a third of the houses in the estate were empty because people had just moved out, boarded up houses everywhere. You could buy a house for a thousand pounds. What was yours, Andrew? Yours was about six grand, wasn't it? It was a bit expensive. Oh, no, that was the one we lived in that was six and a half grand. And we thought it was a bit too pricey at the time. Um, <laughs> you know, smashed up cars everywhere, all sorts of things. And, and this lady thought, let's, let's go for Britain in bloom. And, um, and <laughs> we just thought it was a ridiculous idea. And so um, she, she just recruited everyone. She wasn't in our church, um, just uh, someone in the community. And it was the days when the first Tony Blair government, when the government like gave money to the inner city. <laughs> it was amazing. And, um, and she got this grant and she bought 3,000 hanging baskets, one for every house in the whole estate. And um, these massive planters um, that she put all down the two main roads that run through the estate. And, um, and then she got the schools involved, the shops, uh, all sorts of different people. And um, this massive team together and they all filled, all planted in all of these baskets and in, and in all of the planters. And um, the churches got involved and created all these mosaics. And um, I remember going round on the, the day before the judges came when they, when they completed all the flowers, taking pictures because I thought, 
um, some, someone tonight who... <laughs> Someone, one of like 25 young people that we come to our life center on, <laughs> on a Tuesday, they're just going to walk up and down those streets and just like do this and tip them all up. And um, they didn't. And, um, and the next day, everyone did these like street barbecues and all sorts of things. And the judges came round and Languidi was awarded like, I think it was the, the national award for inner city areas in Britain in Bloom. And they won it for 10 years in a row after that, after that point. And um, it, was a, it was an amazing thing because you still had some glass on the floor and you still had the boards, but there was this like vibrant beauty that was everywhere, wherever you looked. There was this, this, these colors, these, uh, this fragile beauty. And for us, it became like a parable about the kingdom of God in this place that even though it, could, it feels like it could be destroyed by one person just walking up and down the streets, it isn't. And, and, and it stays and it remains and it flourishes and it grows. And, and, and there was something that God was doing within us in that moment through this lady who, I don't know whether she was a person of faith or not, who was just saying to us, here's some hope. <laughs> here's some hope. And, and it's like, it was like the community that had been... Um, they'd been kind of uh, sent into their houses, like people were hiding in the houses because there was such carnage on the streets. Um, and suddenly they started to come out and go, maybe if she could do that and it lasts, that beauty, that fragile beauty lasts, maybe I could do something as well. And little projects started to emerge and, and people just used that as a sign of hope. And, and that's one of the things that has sustained us as a church, that idea that, Yes, we can, we can believe for things. We can step out. We can be a people that, that, that are carriers of God's hope in these places. And so it's, it's learning to live with that fragility and, and knowing that, that we trust in God for that. Um, and, and there's something with that tipping point that happened for us in, in Languedé. Um, I, I was reading through the um, NRSV a couple of years ago uh, through the Bible and got to Isaiah 49 and there's a verse that the NRSV translates as, your builders outdo your destroyers. And that's, that's how it felt to us, that suddenly the, bit, the ones who wanted to build outdid the ones who wanted to destroy, and the destroyers don't go away necessarily altogether, but suddenly the community stands up tall again and just says, that is not acceptable. We're going to build, we're going to step out, we're going to trust, we're going to have faith. Um, and we get these glimpses of hope. It's like that process in Romans 5, you know, at the start of Romans 5, where it says going from suffering to perseverance to character to hope. And, and, and that's what we observed in our community, that, that the suffering that we'd been through led actually because of someone's courage to perseverance. And then perseverance formed our character. Uh, and, and, and then we moved into hope. And we get these glimpses of hope. And I think as, as people of faith, as, as those who God calls into leadership in different ways, it's our job to spot those signs of hope. It's our job to, to tell those stories, to find those stories and to tell them. Um, one of the things we've done in our church is just develop this culture of storytelling. So every single week we'll say, who's got a story about something that God's done this week? Uh, who's, who wants to tell us some good news stories? And sometimes you get some bonkers ones that you don't really want to be told. <laughs> one of our mates, Brian, came up once, big tattooed guy, and he was like, right, uh, I needed 100 quid, so I prayed, went into the bookies, and I won 100 quid. <laughs> so thanks to God. <laughs> and you're just like, thanks, Brian. <laughs> we'll talk about that another time. Um, and, and it just creates this like virtuous cycle where you get into this habit every week of reflecting back on your week and thinking, what did God do? Actually, what am I going to thank God for this week? And you learn to tell those stories. And then it propels you into the next week to go, I didn't have a story to tell this week, so what am I going to look for? How am I going to see God at work in my life this week? And, you know, Stephen Pass in Pilgrims and Priests, which is a very, very good book, recommended. He talks about the church in the secular West, the need for us to develop this spirituality of signs and glimpses, just looking for the signs and the glimpses of God's kingdom and celebrating them. You know, like the, the three parables in Luke 15, 
where it's just this big party happens over one thing, one lost coin, one lost sheep, one lost son. And, and, in what, in, and that's the thing about celebrating the ones and the twos that we need to do more and more of. One might not affect your parish statistics that much, but there's a party in heaven and we need to have a party on earth to celebrate it with food. Always, always include food. Um, a mate of ours, um, Gordon, he came, started coming along to stuff we were doing um, when he was 62. Well, he told us he was 62. Turns out he was about 74. Uh, <laughs> and, and he used to come along to uh, our music nights. And, um, and, it, and he had this, he came to church one Sunday and then he came on the music night on the Friday. And he said, Chris, right, been sat here for an hour. And on Sunday, you talked about this thing where like, you can have an experience of God. And he was like, I've, got, I've had this weird feeling for an hour. And I've realized what it is. I'm happy. <laughs> and he said, I've not felt this for years. Um, and then he came back to church that Sunday. And we, ha- we were doing communion. And I, and I said to everyone, I said, Jesus welcomes everyone to his table. If you want to receive from Jesus today, come. And Gordon had never come for communion before at church. And he st- I saw him stand up with the others. And <laughs> I had this really emotional moment when I looked along this line and I saw all these people, all with their own stories of brokenness and difficulty, all coming to Jesus' table to receive from him. And Gordon came and received. And um, he said to me after, he said, um, and he was in his early 80s by then, and he said, um, that this is, he said, I've always felt like, because of what I've done when I was in the army, that I wasn't good enough for God, um, and I couldn't come. But then you said, Jesus welcomes everyone to his table. And so I came, and he said, this is the first time in my life that I feel like I belong. 80-odd years, the first time in his life that he feels like he belongs. And that's what Jesus does. It's those little signs. I did, his, I did Gordon's um, funeral last year, um, and, and as we celebrated his life, he always used to say to me, um, it's never too late, is it, Chris? It's never too late to come to God. And, and it wasn't a story that he was a 20-year-old guy and he's got this amazing future. It was just really late in his life, a little thing of someone that not many people took much notice of in the community. And yet, that's the thing to celebrate. That's what we did. That's, that's when there's rejoicing in heaven over these things. Um, and, and that's what we have to do. Um, the last thing I want to say before I get Ben to come is just about um, how God provides just enough for us. My mate Sam, who's been leading us in the singing, he calls it the miracle of just enough. I find it a bit annoying that actually. Why doesn't God give me like loads more? <laughs> um, but it's like he just wants to give us enough for today. So we, we're reliant on him um, and it, it drives us to our knees in prayer. And I think whether it's financially, whether it's in different ways, over 24 years, we've just learnt that every day, every day. And every day that we see the provision of God, it reminds us that God is utterly faithful. God is utterly faithful. In the fragility, we can often think in our heads, wow, if that family left this church, this would all go to pot, you know, we wouldn't have enough money, we wouldn't have enough people to do this, um, you know, it could all start to fall apart, and we can start to try and protect what we've got, and go into like survival mode, clinging on to people, and trying to keep what we've got, and then we miss what God's wanting to do, because God's always pushing us outwards, God's always helping, uh, want, encouraging us to think outwardly and uh but our focus can often be on the wrong things in the wrong places the focus has to be on the character of god it has to be on the faithfulness of god your mercies are new every morning great is your faithfulness um on his works in in our congregation um just la- last thing to say really um this kind of little we had a bit of a crisis about four years ago in our church and a couple of massive pastoral issues that blew up and both at the same time, and, and because of some hurt that had gone on because of the actions of a couple of people, a lot, quite a few people stopped coming uh, to the church, and within a few months, our Sunday attendance, which was 
a small church anyway, was probably about half of what it had been. Um, and a couple of people who'd come to faith through the church basically just kind of walked away from God and even to the extent of putting on Facebook that they weren't Christians, which obviously is, means it's real <laughs> because it's on Facebook, it's official. And um, we, were, we were devastated and for about nine months we were not really able to put on a public Sunday service but what we've seen over the, the last four years is just the utter goodness and faithfulness of God again. Um, and we've seen friendships restored that were broken in those times. We've seen people who were not a Christian on Facebook on their knees worshipping Jesus again and, 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 and back in relationship with him. We've, we're seeing people on the fringes come into faith for the first time. We're seeing our young people rising up and taking leadership within the church. We had a youth Sunday a bit ago where we had an 11-year-old preacher and the worship group were 11 to 14. It's just amazing to watch. It's beautiful to see. We've seen incredible financial provision. And in these moments where it feels fragile, what we've learned is just to take a deep breath and to stop looking at who's not here and to focus on God. It's so simple. But actually, we, we forget, don't we? And we worry and we, and, we, and we stress and we think nobody understands this and nobody knows what we're going through. And, um, but the, the fact is, either God is faithful or he isn't. And I'd just like to suggest that he is. <laughs> I don't know if that was controversial. But um, his power is made perfect in our weakness. His grace is sufficient for me. Ben, why don't you come? Ben's just going to reflect a little bit on some of that stuff, and then we'll see what happens. Yeah. Thanks, Chris. Can we give him a round of applause? <laughs> Before I carry on, I'd love you to turn to the person next to you and just say something that stuck out from what Chris has shared. Is that all right? One minute, go. <laughs> hey. Manchester is blue. Yeah. So I'd say we can, I mean, we're pretty flexible with this, to be honest. So we can easily go longer. We can go till 20 past, 25 past. You know, we can take minutes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. 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 Great. Well, my name's Ben. I'm a northerner. I'm from the northwest of England. I am um, uh, born in Preston, lived in Manchester for a long time, known Chris for a long time, and I'm now in Bolton. And uh, I'm a vicar, lead a church plant in Bolton, and lead a network called Antioch in the Diocese of Manchester, which is a, a small church planting network in our council estates and urban communities. And we're passionate about seeing the church being alive in those places. And um, to do that, we're going to need to plant a heck of a lot of churches. Um, we want to see local discipleship and leaders, leaders raised up. Um, I was brought up in suburban Preston from a working class family that made a little bit of money. And then at 17, when I became a Christian, I heard the Lord say to me, two weeks after my baptism, you're going to spend your life living and working on council estates, um, which is hilarious. My family had spent their life trying to get off estates, yeah? <laughs> but I've been on council estates since then. I'm in my 40s, and um, 
It's an absolute joy and honor. And I, and I want us to just look at that passage that Chris touched on in Romans 5. If you've got your Bibles there, uh, Romans 5, verses 3. Let's just read that. We rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance. And endurance produces character. And character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame. Because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who's been given to us. Um, about 10 years ago, uh, I felt the Lord teaching me what it means to be trained for hardship. And, and what began there was a work in me of, of unpacking and dissecting a, th a theology that I had in my heart where Christianity was all about me. And I felt the Lord saying, I'm going to take you through some stuff that's going to be deeply painful. And, and you need to know that it's me that's taking you through that. And I remember um, as I was ex just working through this, thinking, that sounds great, Lord, because it sounds like it's you that's saying that. But it's not, it's not so easy when you're in the midst of it. But my experience of a state ministry is there is plenty of opportunities for suffering <laughs> that produces endurance, isn't there? We might not have a name for it always, but my experiences of estate ministry is, is two years on estates is probably the equivalent of 10 anywhere else. And then um, the extremities of that ministry. But the beautiful thing is, is the Bible that I read seems to say that fellowship with Christ and his suffering is what it means to be Christian. It's just that us lot in the West don't seem to like that idea too much. In fact, we, we seem to resist it at all costs. Where the universal church through the ages and through the, throughout the world is almost shouting at us, saying it's a privilege to suffer with Christ. But if you're honest, and this is me being honest, I don't like that. It's not, it's not, that doesn't sound too good. But that passage there that talks about character, and that's our goal as a Christian, isn't it? Becoming more like Jesus, the person of Jesus. There's no easy route there, is there? Jesus is like, look, <laughs> look at my life. <laughs> look at how it ended. Like, what do you think was going to happen following me? Like, it's just interesting, isn't it? And so uh, the Lord, de a decade ago, started to, to work with me and work with what we were doing and try and teach me what it means to be trained for hardship. That when it comes, it's not so much of a shock that it, it, it's not going to be easy, it's going to be painful. And so uh, I think the state ministry provides many opportunities for participating in the suffering of Christ. I think a state ministry provides many opportunities for our own ideas, agendas, and plans to be disappointed by Jesus. I think a state ministry provides loads of moments where our ego can be torn apart. And Jesus loves that. He loves doing that. Because I, I think for a lot of us, Christianity has become about us. And Jesus is like, I'm, I'm afraid it's nothing to do with you. It's all about me. And so that's something that we've learned in our ministry this last few years. And it's interesting because what I think is really important is what we're not saying here is trained for burnout. Because let's be honest, a lot of us have been close to the edge. In fact, some of us have been over the edge, haven't we? We've got friends who've been over the edge. We've, we've, we all know someone who's been over the edge. And that's, that is not what we're interested in. And it's this real balance, isn't it, between being trained for hardship, but being healthy as well. And I don't think many of us get that fully right. And I'd love someone to do some writing on that. Maybe, Chris, you could do something. <laughs> <laughs> the balance between not being burnt out, but dying to ourselves the balance between being obedient without seeing the results that we'd like and not giving up in the face of that. Um, urban ministry, I think, can be described as being two weeks away from revival and two weeks away from everything falling apart. And it, that's how it's supposed to feel, I think. So if you're feeling like that, well done. You're probably in the right place. But the, the, here's the thing that we've learned. And we've been on th uh, three estates in the northwest, in Manchester and two in Bolton. We planted two churches in Bolton. And then um, the first church plant that we 
that we planted on Oldham's estate, and Mel and her husband, Lee, are the leaders of that church now. Amazing couple. And the first church we planted, we arrived, and we'd been doing urban ministry for a little while. We had this bag of all the ideas that we'd seen work before. And I remember literally that first two weeks, us getting into the estate, moving in, and almost symbolically opening the bag and hearing the Holy Spirit say, what's the bag? <laughs> so whose bag is this? What's, what's in there? Zip the bag up, throw it out, actually, and learn how to get on your knees again. Learn how to pray. And so uh, we always say in our network now, what is your prayer life like? Because your prayer life will tell you how dependent and reliant you are on Jesus, like Chris has just talked about. And we can all talk a good game when it comes to prayer life. But let's be honest, let's look at our lives and let our lives speak for themselves. Like, what is your prayer life like? Jesus said, apart from me, you can do nothing. And we're a bit like, you sure, Jesus? But prayer is a posture, in it, that says, well, I've got nothing unless you show up, Jesus. And for us, a sign of health is a, is a prayer life. In fact, my friend did like an informal study on, on ministries that have fallen apart or people who've fallen out of ministry. And a key denominator is a prayer life dis diminishing. And I'm not talking about a different style. I'm not talking about what style you need to be doing, just as long as you're praying. Um, I try and pray two offices a day. My friend, Father Robert, I think he's in the other room. He prays, he's trying to pray nine offices a day. Whatever works for you, just get a prayer life. You, you need to be praying. Um, so prayer is, is almost a sign that, um, that you're fully reliant. Um, I think another thing that we've, we've often been smashed in the face with is, when did you last laugh in ministry? I, just, I wonder if you asked yourself that question just now and what the answer would be. It's a difficult question, isn't it? Because if the answer is, ooh, it's not, been a, it's not been for a while, then there's something you're going to need to do about that. Um, if you want to see the, the wackiest party church, go and speak to Adam and Kim over there in Doncaster. Their church is incredible. Laughter throughout, discipleship and laughter. It's, it's an absolute beauty. And I think that question is, is a serious question, actually. Because if you've not laughed recently, then something's wrong. And, and actually, I also think that's about hobbies as well. We need to have something that's not in the midst of what you're doing. It gets super intense, super quick, this stuff, doesn't it? So what hobbies have you got? Your hobby is not church, trust me. Don't say, if it's got anything to do with church, it's not a hobby. You're a saddo, go and get a hobby. <laughs> <laughs> like, tr like, when did you last laugh? What gives you life? What makes you smile? Go and do, go and do it. I think this is where we're going to find that balance of trained for hardship, the seriousness of fellowship in Christ suffering, but health and well-being and laughter. Um, and I'm going to finish with this story uh, that's related to that, that verse that Chris brought out, 2 Corinthians 12, that we all want the dynamis power of Christ, don't we? We're like, Lord, we want more of your power. And, but, but often we, we finish that sentence with different things, don't we? The power of Christ may rest upon me if I boast in my skill set or in my attendance. No, it's, it's weakness, isn't it? I boast in my weakness so that the dynamous power of Christ may rest upon me. We, um, we had a guy called Big Sam. He had a big ginger dreadlocks. He was a functional heroin addict, um, a registered anarchist. They have AGM meetings. And... Um, <laughs> You'll see the irony. Um, and he was a militant atheist, Big Sam, militant atheist. And his friend had just OD'd, and he'd, he'd connected with us as a church, so, and we'd heard about him. So I went to his house, and if you've ever been in a heroin addict's house, you'll know what you're going to meet in there. And I remember walking into his bedroom and trying to work out which part of the mattress to sit on. Um, and I sat on it, and I, I, I preached the gospel to his face and said, you've got a plan Jesus loves you. He's got a plan for your life. And I remember him weeping, saying, man, I'm an atheist, but I believe what you're saying is true. And over the next few months, we saw Sam come to faith. We baptized him. And as he came out of the baptism waters, he shouted at his dad, who was just stood here. He's also a militant atheist. And he said, Dad, I've been born again. You should try it. <laughs> and um, and uh, Big Sam was a beautiful man. He still struggled with his heroin use. 
You know, things didn't happen overnight for him. And then one night he died of an overdose. And I remember that week shouting at Jesus. I felt like one of the psalmists, just shouting, saying, how dare you take him? How dare you, Lord, take him? What was the point? And in that moment of complete weakness, like we were really close to the edge that week. I remember just not just us as a family, but corporately as a church, we were close to the edge. We were like, Lord, this feels like a, a beautiful piece of fruit that's just been robbed from us. This is a beautiful person who's been brought into the kingdom. But I remember his mom challenged me, who isn't a Christian. She said, Big Sue said, she's not called Big Sue, sorry. Sue said, <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's Big Sam. Sorry, Sue. Um, <laughs> it's just called Small Sue. Has <laughs> this been recorded? Oh, my days. Oh, Big Sue. Um, <laughs> Sue said, this last three months of Sam's life, I've never seen him so happy. And if it's true what you tell me, he's in the biggest party he's ever been in, in his life. And he used to party, Sam. He, he, but he's in the biggest party now. But that same week, we had the Sunday after his death. So four days later, we had our testimony Sunday. And it's where we invite like, the whole community to come and hear stories of tra transformation. And then we have a big meal at our house afterwards, or somebody's house in the church. And I remember thinking, no, Lord, no, no. let's just cancel church. I don't even know if you're real at the moment, to be honest, Jesus. And then we had some testimonies. There was loads of non-Christian people there, including Sam's family. And then we all piled around to Pete and Catherine's house, the nearest house and the biggest house with the biggest garden on the estate. And then we were, because of the chaos of the week, we just hadn't been that organized. So we had a Christian chili, we had a, a bowl of rice, and I remember we had a hundred people in the garden, and I was on the table, and I, w you know, that exhaustion that you feel that feels painful. You just, your body is just falling apart. That's that's how I felt, um, and I remember swishing the rice around in my, in front of me with a spoon, and then um, people started to line up, and me and my. My friend was stood next to each other. He was on the Christian chili. I was on the rice. And I served five people rice, and the rice had basically gone down to one more spoonful. So I turned back to the kitchen, and, and I said, Lord, I've had enough of this now. I've had enough. And I turned to the kitchen, and I said, more rice, guys. Yeah, bring the rice out. And the reply came, that's the rice. That's all the rice. The rice is out. My friend said, don't panic. I'll ring up Don Domino's. I'll, I'll, Ten big Domino's pizzas. It's a lot of money, but we'll get them in. And I remember just thinking, I just grunted at him. I was so tired, and I just stirred the rice in front of me. And then as I stirred the rice, there's something happening in the bowl. And I thought, it's been a, it's been a ridiculous week. This is just, um, yeah, have, I have I taken drugs? Have I passively smoked weed again? I don't know what it is. Um, <laughs> and I stirred the bowl, continue, and there was rice coming into the bowl from under the spoon. And I, I didn't say anything because I thought, no, I'm, I, I know I'm slightly off the scale, but I, I, this is going to look ridiculous now. And I kept mixing it around, and then I, and my mate punched me in the arm and said, he wasn't a really Christian at this point, he said, what the is just going on in that bowl? <laughs> uh, and the bowl was full of rice, and we served 95 more people from that same bowl of rice. Only me and my friends saw that miracle. But for me, that was 2 Corinthians 12 in action. And it was the beautiful grace of Jesus in the midst of our weakness. He's saying, I'm still here. I'm still for you and for this, this estate. I'm building my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And here's a little token of grace to help you along the way. And that'll probably never happen to me again. And I don't think I've heard of many food miracles like that in the West, actually. It's happening everywhere else apart from here. But it's not, in some ways, it's not about the miracle. It's about weakness, isn't it? And reliance on him. And, and so I'd love us, we're going to go into a prayer ministry time, aren't we, Chris? Is there anything you want to say or reflect back? Because we wanted to have a bit of space, didn't we? I don't think so. I think it'd be good to pray. Um, so the, the plan between now and nine-ish is just to have some space, this to be a a holy space of prayer. Um, if you feel like you've had enough and you want to go to the bar, just do that whenever you want. Uh, if you want to go to bed, feel free to do that. Um, you want to go for a little walk. But in here, we'll just keep it uh, this kind of prayerful space. Sam's going to play a bit, sing a few songs that you can join in with or just sit where you are if you want to. And we'll offer...
prayer for people at different points. Um, but that's so there'll be there'll be a few that won't be really structured. Um, but Sam will Sam will be playing most of that time. Um, so just feel free to do what you like from this point onwards. Um, we um, we'll, we're back. At, I think breakfast is eight, um, and then we're back in here at, at nine. We'll put it on the on the screen at some point, but um, yeah. D- so w- I'm I'm gonna I'll pray. Ben and I'll just uh, perhaps Ben can pray as well p- for us. Maybe you can pray first, and then we'll just Sam. You can come up, and we'll we'll just kind of make that space to see what see what the Lord wants to do and say. It might be for you that you just want to sit and listen and and watch, or it might be that God. You want you think God wants you to pray for someone else in the room or someone near you or whatever, and feel free to gently offer that um, if, if people if people would like that. Um, but let's yeah, Ben, why don't you pray just kind of on the back of what we've said, and then Sam, if you come and um, and then perhaps lead us in a minute. I sense there's a few people here actually, and I know this feeling where we, we talk about boasting in our weaknesses. And I, I really wonder if there's a few people in here who say, I feel too weak to boast in my weaknesses. I hope that makes sense. That you don't feel like you've got the strength. You don't feel like you've got the strength to muster up, to be reliant and boast in your own weaknesses. And Jesus wants you to come to him. His hand is always outstretched to us. He's in the business of, of weakness. In fact, he can't resist it. He says his power is made perfect. In other words, made complete. And so I'd encourage you, if you feel too weak to even boast in your weaknesses, Jesus is here particularly for you. And he wants to refresh you and place his yoke upon you afresh. So Lord, we, um, if we're honest, we know we've got nothing, Lord. Even when we we feel most skillful and most resourced, Lord, we know it's hollow in your kingdom. But we also say, Lord, we we don't know how to be fully reliant on you, Jesus. We've got too much. We don't need you and we don't really want you, Lord, if we're honest. So we ask, Holy Spirit, you'd help us to want to want you, Lord. You'd help us to want to need you, Lord. Develop a thirst for us, for you, Jesus. Help us to bring our brokenness and disappointment to you, Jesus. The feeling that we've been let down to you, Jesus. And we trust the Spirit, the work that you're going to do in and around us now. We pray in your mighty name. Amen.